Um, I first became interested in the topic of etiquette um, about 16 years ago when uh, we were doing an inventory of the Phillips House in Salem, Massachusetts, which is here. Uh, during the inventory, the family didn't like to throw things away, so they kept all of their correspondence, their calling cards, their journals, their diaries, their calendars, their bills, the receipts, and they showed and gave us a great glimpse of how the family lived in Salem uh, during the uh, late 1890s, early 1900s, up until the, they lived in the Phillips House until 1955. So they covered a great period of change in the United States, also in Salem. So today you're gonna to hear about Stephen Willard Phillips, who you see on your left, and his wife, Anna Pingree Wheatland Phillips, who you see on your right. They were both born in the 1870s, which you can imagine. They did not dress uh, in the 1870s like they did in the 1950s. So it was a great period of social change. They lived through the, they started out their lives with horse-drawn carriages and uh, and that's how they made it around from place to place. And these are pictures of the Phillips's carriages that are there at the house uh, still today. And then they transitioned to the age of the automobile. So if you can imagine living through all of that, what a great difference that would make in how fast you could get from one place to another and also how far you could travel uh, in a day or in, in a week. Uh, they also lived through uh, both world, war world wars, uh, the invention of the uh, telephone, and also television. Uh, and life at that time, there was a different set of social standards that they were expected, how they interacted with each other, how they interacted with their friends, and how they interacted with their family. And etiquette, like with fashion and technology, is not a static thing. It changes with uh, times and social expectations. Uh, but even some modern 20th century authors today lament the loss of social structure and guidelines for behavior. One book from today, the 1990s, said one of the lamentable casualties of the recent social revolution is the daily practice of etiquette. It is not that we no longer live in a world in which every dinner is formal and men are left to smoke their cigars after the meal. I refer instead to a society that places no value on manners and a society that seems to believe that manners have no place in the order of things. In our changing environment, confusion reigns and there is no longer a widely accepted standard for public behavior. And how often do we see this when you have a, uh, cell phones ringing during a lecture or if uh, people who are concentrating more in their phone conversations than their drivings? That's my gentle reminder. If you have your phone, please put it on silent. <laughs> Um, I do think that author is going a bit far in saying that the confusion reigns and manners have no place in the order of things. My parents, as I'm sure your parents, taught you how to say please and thank you and how to behave uh, in public. And if you go to the library today, you can find all sorts of books on <laughs> etiquette. So you have your simple uh, your etiquette for dummies. Uh, there's etiquette books for men. There's etiquette books for throwing a party. Uh, and there's always the classic Emily Post etiquette. And uh, if the Emily Post Institute has even created uh, Edipedia, which is your online etiquette encyclopedia. And this has sections on tech etiquette, as well as etiquette for cell phones, social networking, and texting. So I highly recommend a visit to the Emily Post Edipedia. And they also established uh, National Etiquette Week, which this is always the second week in May. And this year it starts on May 9th. So visit the Emily Post website and uh, you will find some helpful information for modern day etiquette. Uh, these are all topics that Anna Phillips and her husband Stephen Willard Phillips would be familiar with, just updated for the times. And Anna would have been expected to know all of this information and one of the social occasions that Anna attended would be afternoon tea. So afternoon tea came around first in England in around 1840, when Anne, who was the Duchess of Bedford, she was a lady in waiting to Queen Victoria, requested that light sandwiches be brought to her in the late afternoon because she had a sinking feeling through the long time between the luncheon and the dinner hours. So she began to invite others to join her for her afternoon snack, and the tradition sp spread. In England, tea time is around, usually around 4 o'clock. However, in the United States, it can be anywhere between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m., depending on when the family had dinner. By the late 
1880s and 1890s, afternoon tea in the States is a full-blown social occasion. There's special tea gowns, there's tea services, there's specific etiquette books that are published that give you advice on how to behave at a tea, how to host tea, how to serve a tea, and pretty much they all emphasize that conversation should be kept light and ladylike. It should include some small sandwiches, scones, sweets, and of course, tea. So here's a photo of Anna. Uh, she's here with the lovely flowered hat with her friends uh, at a garden parting tea. And you can see they have musical instruments, their tea's over in the corner, and then a poor little younger brother off sitting in the side who does not look quite enthused to be attending the afternoon tea with his sister. Uh, it, so it sh should include, when you're attending a tea, you should see a tiered tray. You have your savories first, your scones next, and your sweets last. And they're generally placed on the tiered tray in that order. So you have some, these are, this is a very hearty tea I attended in Vermont. There were some very hearty sandwiches in the bottom, but scones in the middle and the sweets on the top. Uh, you should remember to eat your scones and your sandwiches in delicate bites. Uh, you must remember to smile and chat between bites. And when you have your scone, you want to split it horizontally with a knife. And then with your, if you like jam and cream on your, cream on your scone, you want to place enough jam and cream on your plate and then pass the jam and cream on. And then you use your knife to place the jam and cream on your scone. And then you eat the del delicate bite, making sure not to get it all over your face or your clothing. <laughs> your tea is always served by the hostess or by a friend, <coughs> never by your domestic staff or your servants, uh, because it's never poured out and handed out a cup, several uh, cups at a time because it cools very quickly. So you want to have one person who pours the tea and hands it directly to the guest. And it's considered an honor to be asked to pour the tea. You are considered the guardian of the teapot and it implies sterling social graces and profound trust. So it's a big deal to be asked, some, someone asks you and says, would you like to pour the tea? And Anna Phillips even made note on her daily calendar from February 9th of 1918 that she attended a silver tea at Mrs. John Rawson's at 4 p.m. and she poured the tea. So it was, she was very excited. She attended the tea, made note, and wrote down uh, that she was asked to pour the tea for the guests. Now, if you attended the tea, it is considered rude to stir one teas in wide circular motions. Proper etiquette requires that the teaspoon be held at the six o'clock position. And then if you take milk in your tea, you want to fold it gently towards the 12 o'clock position two or three times without clanking on the side of the saucer. <laughs> so you may think folding tea sounds simple, but it's actually slightly more challenging um, and than you think. When you're done folding in your extra milk, uh, you should never drop your spoon onto the table. You want to put it gently on the side of your saucer. And when not in your use, your teacup and your saucer should be placed uh, back on the table or if there is no table, you should place it uh, gently on your lap. You also never want to set your fork directly on the table. Uh, you want to set it on the side of the plate. And sugar at this time came in cubes, and you want to make sure that you select your sugar with the tongs, not with your fingers. And when drinking tea, you want to sip it very slowly and not to gulp it all down. Another part of daily life that Anna would have been familiar with, along with her tea etiquette, would be letters and letter writing. Uh, if you had not been introduced, formally introduced to somebody, you could not just dash off and send them a note. Uh, you wanted to, you had to make sure you knew the person you were writing to. So we have an example of this in that Anna Wheatland becomes engaged to Stephen Willard Phillips. One of her friends writes to Anna wanting to congratulate Stephen Willard Phillips on the great news that he, she's become engaged. However, he has not yet met Stephen Willard Phillips so he writes, uh, my dear Anna, your ears are no doubt full of the hearty congratulations of your young friends. Can you welcome the more sober voice of one who is still young enough at heart to rejoice in the happiness which comes to his juniors? It is one of the queer conventions of society that where I mean to congratulate Mr. Phillips on his engagement to you as an exceedingly delightful privilege for him, I should write you about it. So I want part of the congratulations of this note to glance off in his direction. I know you and I'm glad to believe in his manliness and worth on which everybody seems to agree. So please accept for both of you the assurances of my regard and my wishes for your united prosperity and happiness. I am sincerely yours, Edwin C. Bowles. 
So he doesn't know Stephen Willard, so he's writing Anna, say, please tell him I'm very excited. One of my favorite parts of the letter is how it's addressed. All it says is Miss Wheatland, Salem, Massachusetts. <laughs> Somehow it managed to be delivered uh, and Anna uh, kept the letter um, in, in her archives, which is great. Uh, Anna also received a letter from her Aunt Sue, who also wished to congratulate Stephen Willard, but did not, did not know him. Anna's Aunt Sue writes, My dear Annie, I cannot wait one moment to thank you for writing me this lovely bit of news. I wish I knew Mr. Phillips so that I could at once congratulate him for the treasure he has secured. However, he no doubt fully realizes the happiness that is to come to him, and I am very happy for you too, my darling niece. I would like to be prompt in sending you a little memento for the coming announcement, but she'll have to wait till I can get out somewhere. Always very lovingly yours, Aunt Sue. So according to the etiquette guidelines of the day, the, your letter should be free of all flourishes. They should follow the rules of punctuation. There should be no ink blots or erase marks or stains or abbreviations. Uh, but these are general guidelines. And as you can imagine, not everyone was a stickler for uh, these rules as seen in these two examples, um, also kept by Anna in her collection. Uh, but they did, they, these followed the etiquette guidelines in that they are on plain cardstock um, and not lined paper. And in this case, uh, they did address the recipient correctly. If you knew a member or was a member of your family, you could use their Christian name, uh, so Dear Anna, or a family member said Dear Annie. If you did not know a person or they were, they were a slight acquaintance, you needed to be uh, more formal. Dear Miss Wheatland, if she was unmarried, or Dear Mrs. Phillips, if she was. In this next example, a friend of Stephen Willard's wrote both Stephen Willard Phillips and Anna a letter of congratulation. And note how he, the difference in how he addresses each letter. In his letter to Stephen Willard, he writes, My dear Stephen, many, many congratulations. It is most charming to think of our keeping up alliances at home. Salem Sons for Salem Daughters makes a very happy community. Knowing Richard Wheatland so well and Miss Anna slightly, I have taken the liberty to write her a congratulatory letter and hope soon to call. Stephen, a woman whose life is so full of charity, possessing such rare personal charms, is indeed the far superior of most men and a fitting companion to one who has shown himself so noble a son. I hope you will give my best wishes to your mother and brother, and believe me, very sincerely yours, Alfred Putnam Goodell. Mr. Goodell also writes a letter to Anna, and he writes, My dear Miss Wheatland, if at all presuming, I beg you will pardon the fault, but I feel so overjoyed, I must congratulate you on the happy announcement of your engagement to one of the noblest and fine men of our dear old city. So he's hoping, he's like, oh, I'm not doing the right thing. It's going to be, she's going to be mad, but um, he also then extols uh, the, he also extols Stephen Willard's good qualities in the middle section of the letter. And at the very end, he writes, please accept again my hearty best wishes and believe me, sincerely yours, Alfred Putnam Goodell. He has lovely handwriting and follows all the rules of punctuation. Uh, and to assist people with writing letters, the American, write, American Manifold Writing Paper Company published a booklet entitled Useful Information for People Who Write Letters. Anna purchased a copy of this book and even uh, embroidered a cover uh, for the book uh, to have which she kept in her desk. And it includes useful information for spelling, punctuation, rules for using capital letters, and rules for letter writing, and also a short dictionary of frequently used words. And I think this would be used frequently today. I mean, I have a handy, uh, and everyone has their phone where you can look things up. Uh, but even from Anna and Stephen Willard's time, letter writing had changed from the 1880s uh, into the early 1900s. In 1884, a woman named Mrs. Sherwood was very concerned about the length of letters that were being, writing, being written. She wrote, the electric telegraph, cheap, cheap postage, and the postal card may be set in a way to ruin correspondence in the old sense. Can you imagine what Mrs. Sherwood would think in today's world of email and tweets? <laughs> I'm sure she would be quite horrified with all the little misses that uh, get sent today. And even today, letter writing is not the most common form of communication. Does anyone remember the last time they received a handwritten letter, like going on about your daily, the weather, what you did in the day? Anyone? Last time you wrote a letter? Yay, one person, oh, two people. That's great, three people, fantastic. It's a huge, um, encouraging, great three people. I'm very excited, um, but it's a great record of the past and captures a little bit about daily life and what you did. So I encourage you to keep writing letters, or if you think of someone, write your grandchildren a letter. They will love it. So letter writing was one form of communication available to the Phillips family. Another would be paying calls or visits on members of the same social set. 
by 1900, which is when Anna and Stephen, Anna Phillips will be playing most of her calls, calling, calling hours were usually at a set time, generally between 3 and 6 p.m. or 4 and 7 p.m., depending on when the family had dinner. If you were paying on call, you wanted to avoid the luncheon and dinner hours. You could pay an evening call if you knew the family well, as long as the call was no later than 9 o'clock and not prolonged until after 10. Like today, generally, you don't call people on the phone after 10 p.m. A call should never extend over half an hour. 15 to 20 minutes was the, considered the appropriate length. So it's not like you talk to one person for hours and hours. You said you have 20 minutes, you're going to visit a bunch of people on the same day. If one could, you would devote one afternoon a week to one's friends. So you would spend one afternoon a week at your house so that people could come call on you during a set period of time. But if you had a set days and hours to be at home, you needed to make sure that people knew when to call on you. So on your calling card, you would put your reception day in the bottom corner. It was also important to remember to keep track of the calls made and how many calls were paid upon you, which would be a return call. Calls should be returned no sooner than a month and no later than a year. This is why you had a book. Uh, the exception was if you had been entertained at a dinner or tea party, you wanted to make sure that you returned the call within the week. So Anna had a visits book in which she kept track of all that information. So there was a column for the name of the person, the reception day if they had one, when she was received and when the call was returned. You would try to group your visits on one day in order to make the most use of your time. So on February 16th of 1900, Anna visited seven people, uh, the Mrs. Allen on Chestnut Street, Mrs. W.S. Stearns on Essex Street, Mrs. David Little on Chestnut Street, Mrs. Chase on Carpenter Street, Mrs. Fed Roundhead on Federal Street, Mrs. McMalew, and the Mrs. Malone also on Chestnut Street. And for those not familiar with Salem, Anna at the time was living over here on Warren Street, and she paid calls on Chestnut Street, Essex Street, and Federal Street, which all run uh, parallel to each other. When you paid a call, it was important to rise to leave when you were the speaker and not when conversation had languished. So just because no one was talking doesn't mean that it was time to uh, get up and go. Uh, also, when you paid a call, it was very important to have a calling card, which are another thing that uh, we don't have around very much today. According to the Ladies' Home Journal of 1900, calling cards are accredited representatives of our personal identity. Another author said the following about calling cards. To the unrefined or underbred, the visiting card is but a trifling and insignificant bit of paper. But to the cultured disciple of social law, it conveys a subtle and unmistakable intelligence. Its texture, style of engraving, and even the hour of leaving it combine to place the stranger, whose name it bears, in a pleasant, pleasant or disagreeable attitude, even before her manners, conversation, and face have been able to explain her social position. So even though they were little pieces of paper, they said a lot about um, who you were. There were a predetermined size for calling cards. A uh, gentleman's card was always three inches by one and a half inches. And a lady's card is slightly larger, three and a half inches by two and a half inches with their name. And if they had one, their reception day in the corner. You're, you left your card upon your, the departure of your visit. So you paid your call, your 15, 20 minutes are up, you're leaving, you leave the card with the servant, with the silver tray on your way out, acknowledging that you had been there and you had paid a visit. The other time that you left your call is if you had called on the house and the lady was not at home and you were not received. Then you would leave the card with the servant and let them know that you had paid the call but the lady was not home. Why again, why you have a book? <laughs> why you have to uh, keep, uh, keep track of um, who you called upon. If for some reason you wanted to drop an unwelcome ac acquaintance, all you had to do was omit sending cards and you could not substitute a call in person with a card. So if someone had paid you the honor of calling you one person, you could not send a card and say, oh, check, I've returned that visit. You needed to actually go to their house and pay your return visit uh, in person. Another way that uh, Anna would interact with society was at home days. At home days also had special cards that announced uh, those days to the uh, neighborhood. They were generally five inches by four inches and you have the hostess at the top and the uh, young lady in the middle and also the dates and the times. And these are three examples uh, where these are special at home days, they were gonna be at home, that way you would be expected to call upon these families during those days and times. You could also have at home days at different venues uh, with dancing. And here are four other examples. 
Um, they also, the cards were very specific, letting you know if there was dancing, so you knew which attire to wear, and also if you needed to RSVP as well. One uh, item that has not changed very much from Anna and Stephen Willard Phillips' day are wedding invitations. Um, those are pretty much the same. Here's Anna Phillips' wedding invitation from 1899 uh, with her wedding ring and where they got married, which happened to be at her mother's house. So there's a very simple ceremony, nothing fancy. Uh, but the wording is pretty much the same that you would see today. One difference is many wedding announcements from that time often contain calling cards to let the guests know when the married couple would be at home and ready for a visit. So these are two examples where the, the announcement was sent out with a calling card letting you know when the wedding was and also when the newly married couple would be home so you could pay them a congratulatory uh, visit. You don't get that very often uh, today. Another social occasion would be uh, dances. Uh, this is Hamilton Hall, which is the meeting hall on Chestnut Street, just down the road from where Stephen Willard Phillips is and Anna lived. And these are three invitations. Generally, dancers were sponsored by uh, patronesses or a small committee uh, who put it together, and they generally picked a charity to fundraise for. And so on the invitation, they would let you know that the subscription was $2. So essentially, your subscription was your donation uh, to the charity that the Ladies' Committee was supporting. Um, also, the local museum, in this case was the Essex Institute, now the Peabody Essex Museum, was also uh, hosting a dinner. Um, they also clearly specified on the invitation that no re requests for gifts would be made. So this meant you could go and enjoy your dinner and you didn't have to worry about being asked for any funds. Uh, at these social occasions, ladies and gentlemen would be expected to behave in a certain way. So here we have Stephen Willard Phillips. Again, he was born in the 1870s. Uh, and lived until 1955. He's at various stages in his life here. And he, uh, if he met someone on the street, he would always remove his right glove because he still wore gloves at this time when shaking hands with a lady. And he should also rise when a lady comes into the room. And I have to say my very first meeting uh, at the Phillips House with the Board of Trustees, I had just graduated college. I was going to my first Board of Trustees meeting. I walked in and all the gentlemen, all our board was all gentlemen, they were all seated. They all stood up as soon as I walked in. I was like, wow, <laughs> what's going on? Um, but so it still exists today, which was pretty fantastic. Um, they pulled up my chair and we continued on with the meeting. Um, but Stephen Wooler would have been very familiar with that uh, and that ladies come into the room. Uh, the gentleman, if seated, would stand up. Uh, he would also open the door for the lady to enter first. And when walking, he should not have his hands in his pocket, but he should carry a cane or a stick. He would also raise his hat to persons that he is acquainted with if he passes them on the street. Not too many hats na nowadays. Uh, but he should also know how to fence, box, ride, shoot, swim, carry himself gracefully, and most importantly, dance. So there was a lot expected of gentlemen uh, at this time. And even young Stevie Phillips, who you see here in the bottom left, uh, was given weekly dancing lessons and carpentry lessons in order to create a well-rounded young man. Uh, his mother writes Stevie a letter in 1920. Stevie is 13 and he's away at Milton Academy. Uh, so here's Anna and she's writing Stevie. She's like, Dear Stevie, I'm sending you by the same mail a pair of white gloves which you must take to dancing school with you. They are the best I could get in Salem and I hope they will fit. Be sure when you go to dancing school to put on a clean shirt and collar and clean stockings and a new necktie and your blue suit. Take your slippers in your pocket and wear your shoes and rubbers if it rains. I shall not send up for you on Saturday unless you telephone me to come. Do try and brace up in your lessons. Your loving mother, Anna P. Phillips. So you give a sense of what Stevie had to wear to da dancing lessons and also that he was taking dancing lesson lessons. A few years later, Stevie is now 16. Here's Stevie. He's still at Milton, Milton Academy. Uh, it's 1924 and he's writing, Dear Mother, I went to the dance. At first I thought my shoes would bind my sore heel, but Shaw brought me a pair of Graydon Uptons and they were quite large enough. I liked it better than last year. I'm sorry this ink is so bad, it is somewhat diluted and is floating on mercury. So I can't think of anything else to write now from your loving son, Stephen Phillips. They're always very formal in all of their letters. They're always signed with their full name. Um, and we're gonna have one more example and that's poor Stevie, even his father, Stephen Willard, takes time to remind his son about the proper attire. Stevie is now 17 and his father is writing him. 
Dear Stevie, I am writing you to be sure and remember to bring back all your clothes that you will need during the holidays. Be sure and bring back your tuck suit and your shirts, your studs and collar buttons, and black ties that go with it, as you will have probably several parties to go to. Then be sure you bring in home enough of your heavy things, your rubbers, your heavy sweaters, and thick vests. And above all, don't forget your fur coat and your stocking cap, which you will need for riding. <laughs> Try not to forget any of these things and look over the list carefully when you are packing up. Get your bag packed if you can the night before and fold your tux suit carefully. Affectionately, Stephen W. Phillips. So <laughs> here's Stevie in his fur coat and his hat. So he must have followed his father's directions and remembered to bring all of his clothing home uh, from Milton uh, back to Salem. So there was a lot of trunks in those days. It's not like you have a small overnight bag. You needed a lot of luggage and um, large cars at this point uh, to transport you back and forth. And even young Stevie Phillips was concerned about etiquette. In his address calendar book from 1925, uh, he's now 18 and he's at Harvard, he made notes about the proper way to behave. He wrote, when walking with a girl on the sidewalk, always take the curb. They would prefer taxi cabs to walking. Start early, then you may be on time. And at certain places, such as hotel lobbies, men should go first. Be well posted on pertinent subjects, no more than your girl. Those were his, if Stevie has horrible handwriting, but those are all his notes on how to behave. And on the opposite page, uh, he has a list of young women uh, and some identifying characteristics. Miss Dolliner has flaxen hair. Uh, Miss Betty Seaver is short and fat. And Miss Kay Saunders wears a gold brace for her teeth. So these are obviously <laughs> not things that Stevie would, should be noting about young ladies of his acquaintance, but I also don't think that he thought we would be looking through his uh, <laughs> journals <laughs> many, many, many years later. But it gives you an idea of, even Stevie was reading books about how to behave in etiquette, and he got some things right um, about walking on the curb and going first in lobbies. Uh, and a gentleman should also not lounge in his chair, bite his fingernails, or cross his foot over his knee. Now on to the ladies. So maybe, yes. So here we have Anna Phillips. Again, various time periods from when she's a young girl, or 1907 with Stevie, um, with her friends, just after she was married in 1900, and sitting in the garden um, on Chestnut Street. A lady should also not sit cross-legged or sidewise, and she should not twirl ribbons or buttons on her clothing. She should project an atmosphere of unruffled strength that gives confidence and repose. She should have a flexible dignity, a commanding gentleness, a thorough womanliness of her look, speech, and demeanor. A gentlewoman is known by her quiet self-possession. Another uh, author from an etiquette book published in the uh, 1880s, which is what Anna would have been reading, stated, in this country, the United States, more than any other, women should, to some extent, cultivate a spirit of independence. They should acquire a knowledge of how business is transacted, of the relation between capital and labor, and of the value of labor, skilled and unskilled. As a housekeeper, they would then be saved from many annoyances and mistakes. In social life, we find that the truest wives, the most patient and careful mothers, and the most exemplary housekeepers, the model sisters, the wisest philanthropists, and the women of the greatest social influence are women of cultivated minds. And Anna Phillips reflect, reflected this in the records she kept of all of her business transactions, uh, and she was extremely organized. This is just a small sample of um, all the trunks that we found during inventory, which she had bundled all her bills and receipts together by year and labeled them bills for 1890, bills for 1891, bills for 1900, um, but also gives you an idea of what the family was buying and uh, how they were living. Anna had her own bank account and access to her own funds. She actually gave Stephen Willard Phillips his monthly household allowance for things that he needed to purchase for the house, but she essentially controlled all the household finances. She was in charge of paying all the servants, ordering the groceries, and planning the menu with a cook. She paid all the bills and also managed the daily activities of the staff. She kept calendars for each month, and each day she kept track of what the weather was like, who she paid, and when she had dinner or tea engagements. So here's a small glimpse of one of her calendars from April of 1918. So she's filled in all the little thoughts of what she did each day, and we can take a closer look um, at some four days. On, on Tuesday, April 9th, the weather was fine and cold. She was in all day. Uh, she had Gertrude Hall to lunch, and she paid Julia to date. Uh, Julia Cronin was the cook at the time uh, for the Phillips family. On Wednesday the 10th, she had an SASAP meeting at 10 a.m., and she paid Delia to date. SASAP was a special aid society for American preparedness, 
uh, which was founded in World War I to help with the war effort. On Thursday the 11th, it was windy and dusty. She went to see Mary Cutter and she paid Catherine to date. Catherine Shaughnessy was the upstairs maid. And on Friday the 12th, they had a snowstorm in April. Hopefully we will be avoiding that. And uh, she took Mrs. Phillips to Almy's. She also went to the bank to see about buying a Liberty bond. John and Ida Duncan came to lunch and were spending the night. Mrs. Phillips was to dinner and she paid Mary Sullivan who, was there, uh, who did their laundry. We can also even go back and take a look and see what Anna wrote for today, April 22nd, except in 1918. In 1918, it was a Monday. Uh, the weather was fine and warm and she went to an SASAP meeting in Boston. She called on Mary and she went to see the opera, The Prophet, which was a uh, French opera that was published in, first came out in 1849. In the 18, 1920 census, Anna lists her occupation as housekeeper, and I think she took great pride in how well her household was won, run. And this image you're looking at Anna's sitting room, or what today we might call her office. But this is uh, her desk and this is where she conducted all of the uh, household daily business. Anna also spoke French, played the piano, she painted watercolors, she traveled extensively, she also enjoyed art, reading, and gardening. She collected stamps and also listened, had a great collection of records. So here's her uh, early watercolors uh, from the 1890s. She also kept a list of all the books and that she read. So there is poetry, there's fiction, there's uh, nonfiction. She was an avid gardener and planned out the formal gardens uh, that were right next to the Phillips house. So she has many garden, catalog garden catalogs and um, seed orders. She also was an avid stamp collector. Uh, we have books and books and albums of stamps. And you can see on this letter she wrote, stamp, keep. So oh. it was a, a stamp, a very important stamp that she wanted to keep, which we did. Uh, and also her list of records that she had in her collection, and mostly opera and classical. And uh, also Anna was a member of the uh, Thread and Needle Society, which was a local sewing circle in Salem. Also the National Society of the Colonial Dames, the Salem Female Charitable Society, and as I mentioned before, the Special Aid Society for American Preparedness. So in addition to all of those activities, Anna also managed the domestic staff and supplied all of their uh, vacuums and carpet sweepers and cooking utensils. And with the staff, she was expected, the staff were expected to behave in a certain way and Anna was expected to treat them in a certain way. One book from 1920 stated, courtesy exacts courtesy and it is extremely vulgar for a mistress or master to give orders to servants in a cross, peremptory or domineering tone or manner. A pleasant voice and amiable look in addressing them are marks not only of kindness, but of good breeding in an employer. The Phillipses had five staff members. They had a chauffeur named Patrick O'Hara, an outdoor man named Connie Flynn, and three female servants. Um, you had Julia the cook, uh, Bridget Durgan, who, who also a leader cook, Catherine Shaughnessy, uh, who was the upstairs maid, and Stevie's nursemaid, and Delia Cowley, who was their waitress. Uh, all three female servants lived in the house on the third floor. Uh, this is one of the servants' room uh, at the Phillips's, Phillips house. Uh, unlike the, what you see in Downton Abbey, at the Phillips house, the servants ate the same meal uh, that the Phillipses ate. Uh, it wasn't quite as formal as that. Uh, they had Thursday and Sunday afternoons off, and they also attended uh, mass on Sundays. They had, uh, this was the kitchen at the Phillips house where the servants worked, and this was their space. Uh, we had a, a granddaughter of Delia Cowley come to visit, who remembers visiting her um, great aunt, excuse me, great aunt in the 1920s after school, and that when Mr. and Mrs. Phillips had to, came to talk to the staff, they would stand in the doorway of the kitchen and have a conversation, but the kitchen was the space for the servants to have uh, their guests and their sort of their own space. Uh, according to, uh, to secure, if you want to secure a good service, you would also want to treat your staff with the consideration that one would expect to receive were the positions reversed, never forgetting that your staff are fellow mortals and not machines. And the Phillipses must have been very agreeable employers to work for because three of their staff members worked for them for more than 25 years. So uh, it's a great it's a sort of insight on the relationship between the Phillipses and their um, domestic staff. Neatness and good and respectful manners and faithfulness are all qualities of a good servant. And if the servant was discontented, it was better to leave than to upset, upset the household with complaints and criticisms. A good servant is never awkward. 
They never let any article drop, and they should deposit their plates, glasses, knives, forks, and spoons noiselessly. They should walk lightly and never slam the doors, and neatness is indispensable. A slovenly and inattentive servant betrays a slovenly household. So here are pictures of um, three of the Phillips staff members, Catherine Shaughnessy, Patrick O'Hara, and uh, Lena, who was Stevie's first nursemaid when he was a little boy. And domestic staff are also mentioned in letters between Stephen Willard Phillips and Anna. The family spent most summers up in New London, New Hampshire, and then they would come back to Salem for the fall. So here's their uh, little house in New London, and Stephen Willard is writing Anna to tell her uh, that he's gotten back down to Salem. He writes, Dear Annie, I got down safely yesterday afternoon. Everything is all right at home, and the house is well aired and dried. The parlor is all clean and ready to put down the rugs as soon as you are ready to come down. I had Connie take out the big rugs in yours and Stevie's room and clean them. I think the house will be all right when you get back. Your trunk has come and I unpacked it, and Caddy took out your things as you told her. Affectionately, Stephen Willard Phillips. <laughs> in addition to unpacking and cleaning rugs, uh, the domestic staff would also be expected to help when the Phillips had a large luncheon or dinner party. So dinner is the principal meal of the day, and the object of the dinner party is not to make a, a display of the fine table furniture or too elaborate cook cookery, but to promote agreeable social intercourse and conversation among friends. According to etiquette books of the day, invitations to dinner should be sent about two to three weeks in advance. However, most of the cases in the Phillips collection, they're about a week and a half to two weeks in advance. Upon receiving the invitation, you as a guest should reply within 24 hours in order to be courteous to your hosts. And here's an example of an invitation written uh, by Anna to Stephen Willard before they were engaged. She writes, my dear Mr. Phillips, will you give me the pleasure of dining with us on Thursday, December 19th at half past six o'clock? Believe me, very truly, Anna P. Wheatland, December the 12th. So very short and sweet, nothing formal. Uh, another invitation is, dear Mr. Phillips, will you and your brother dine with us next Monday evening at seven o'clock? Very informally indeed. I take it for granted that you are both going to the assembly that evening, and we can all go from here. Even if you are not going to the party, we shall hope to see you both. We expect to have Miss Hedge from Plymouth staying with us then, and we should like so much to have you meet her. Hoping you have no other engagement, and that we shall surely have the pleasure of seeing you and your brother. I am very sincerely, Mary R. Robinson. If you are hosting a dinner party, you cannot invite a gentleman without their wives. The host and hostess should also make sure they invite a balanced number of talkers and listeners so that there is a balanced conversation. <laughs> so you don't want to have all listeners and no conversation. Uh, the number of people to invite should be no less than six and no more than 12. Uh, for a dinner for six, you should always have two servants to serve the meal. As a guest, you should be punctual. A hostess should only wait 15 minutes for a tardy guests. Punctuality for the guest is an obligation. As a guest, if you arrive for dinner, you would enter the front door and be escorted into the parlor. When dinner was announced, the host or hostess would leave the, par the host would leave the parlor first, escorting the eldest lady or the greatest stranger. The hostess would leave the party last with the greatest stranger or with the person she wished to place in the seat of honor. Husbands should not escort their wives and brothers should not escort their sisters. You have to keep this all straight. Uh, generally, the hostess was the, one hostess was the one responsible for keeping the conversational ball rolling. However, we have first-hand accounts that Stephen Willard Phillips would begin each dinner with a brief lecture on the topic of his choosing. And some of his lecture topics included the wreck of the wager, the Pacific Islands, and the reaction to the war, the mutiny of the ship Globe of Nantucket in 1824, the North Church of Salem, Massachusetts, Captain Cook and his exploration of the South Seas, or remarks on the history of navigation. Stephen Willard Phillips was very fascinated with maritime history, but my personal favorite are the five fully typed pages of remarks that Stephen Willard Phillips gave on Thanksgiving dinner on November 28th of 1940, um, astounding the history of Thanksgiving dinner uh, at the Phillips family, all the past dinners, what they ate, and what the day was all about. <laughs> so Stephen Willard was the, the chatty one in this case. Uh, the dining room air should be fresh and the temperature agreeable. There should be no dust on the furniture and nothing should be askew. The tablecloth should be straight and smooth and the silverware should be placed in the order that is to be used. And there should be nothing on the table that is not actually needed. So here's a, a picture of the dining room at the Phillips house uh, with the table set for dinner. Uh, and you can see it's a large room, bright and airy. 
The Phillipses entertained one to two times a week and also dined out at friends one to two times a week. More often than not, they had their good friends, the Putnams, for dinner uh, because the Putnams had a son named Alfred, whose nickname was Bunny, and Bunny and Stevie were the same age and were the best of friends. And Bunny ended up growing up and working for Stephen Willard Phillips in his law office. And what's great is Bunny, so here we have Bunny, here's Bunny. Uh, he remembered having dinner at the house and uh, Bunny lived until the mid-1990s and we asked him what was it like having dinner and so this is what Bunny said he wrote now the Phillips's household consisted of course of Mr. and Mrs. Phillips and Stevie and a cook and a maid and a nurse and a chauffeur and an outdoor man the maid was Delia Cowley she was a very dignified lady and knew exactly the protocol of all the meals that were served Caddy, or Catherine Shaughnessy by name, was Stevie's nursemaid when he was a little boy, but she stayed on for years and years until after the Phillipses had left the house. Caddy became a second maid when Stevie grew up a bit, so at a large luncheon party or dinner party, they would have two waitresses busy at the table. The table was always set with white tablecloths and had lovely silver candelabra with burning candles in it with little Japanese shades over the flame, which fascinated me. My mother and father had two of these Japanese shades, but the Phillipses had four on this one bracket. Mrs. Phillips demanded proper eating habits of little boys. She was a lovely lady, but very strict in certain respects about manners at the table. And if the maids got talking too much in the pantry, she would bang on the table and say, quiet there, which was very startling for me to witness. Mr. Phillips, Stevie's father, would carve the beef. It was a great joy to see him wield that knife with such skill. He was really very, very skillful at it. And then after dinner, my father and Mr. Phillips would go into the library and have their cigars. Stevie and I would join mother and Mrs. Phillips in the parlor, which was a very dull period for me. So <laughs> poor Bunny had long dinners to endure, um, but here's uh, the pantry that he talked about uh, where this is where the maids would prepare the dinner. Uh, the kitchen is just through the pass through here. So the cook would be in the kitchen and she would pass the dishes here. Uh, where they would be plated on the serving dishes and then your plates are here on the opposite side. And here you can see just through that door, so it's really close, it's not that far. Um, if they got too noisy, you could definitely hear them here in the dining room. <laughs> uh, the Phillipses generally had a five course meal, uh, starting with your soup, uh, then your fish, then your main course, then your salad, and then dessert. Think very different portions than what we have today. <laughs> they're not huge heaping portions, uh, they're very small. But the etiquette that Bunny refers to would be this. You should never speak with food in your mouth. Well, you do that today. You should not play with the table furniture or crumble your bread into little bits. Um, as soon as you were seated at the table, you should place your napkin in your lap. Uh, if they were serving wine at dinner, uh, getting intoxicated, as one book put it, was decidedly low. So you did not have to drink the wine, you could have water. Uh, you would always break your bread with your fingers, you would never cut it with your knife, and you have your bread with the fish course. At this point in time when Stephen Willard Phillips and Anna were hosting dinner, the napkins are simply folded, folded. there's no fanciful sh fanciful sh fancy shapes. So here we have a, a simply folded napkin, here's the place setting. You have your outside fork, outside sp spoon for your soup, and then your fish fork in the middle, then your main course fork in the middle, and in the middle, and then closest to the plate and closest is the main course fork. So you just work from the outside in, but those are all needed for each of the courses. Uh, there should never be more than three forks. You always want to place the soup plate on the service plate. You don't want your guests to see a bare tablecloth. So this is a service plate which is set on the table. So the table's all ready when the guests arrive, all set up just like this with your bread plate, your glasses that you need, all your silverware. And when the soup comes, it will be uh, passed around and set right on top of your service plate. Your soup plate, the hostess would serve, and you don't get a whole bowl of soup, you get six tablespoons of soup. So that was the serving, so that's what I mean about portions. So the portions, when you're starting, you get just a small amount of each thing. It's not like you're having huge, a huge bowl of soup, a huge whole piece of fish, a huge whole beef. Um, if you must tilt your soup bowl, and the bowls at this time are very shallow, you should um, tilt it from the edge closest to you so the soup gathers at the far end. You don't want to tilt the farthest end and dump it all over you. Uh, you should also eat soup from your spoon noiselessly. You should sit from the side of the spoon unless you have a mustache. Then you can sip from the tip of the spoon. <laughs> so, but side of the spoon is the proper way to eat the soup. 
Uh, no plate should be removed until everyone is finished, and women should remove their gloves and lay them in their laps while they're eating dinner. Uh, tucking them in at the wrists was considered inelegant. It's polite to take a little of everything unless you have health problems. My parents called that the no thank you portion, so that you had something, even if you didn't think you were gonna like it, um, you had a little bit and you tried it, at least you can say you tried it. And if something goes wrong, one of my favorite bits of advice from a 19th century uh, manners book is, whatever may go wrong, the lady of the house should remain calm. If she is anguished, who can be happy? So, <laughs> if something happens, if a dish breaks, no worries, remain calm, it will be all right. Uh, once dessert had been served and eaten, the hostess would make eye contact with one of the ladies. They would rise and the ladies would depart to the parlor and the gentlemen would depart to the library to smoke their cigars out of the presence of the ladies. And then once their cigars had smoked, everyone would rejoin in the parlor. So here is the parlor where the ladies would go. The dining room is just through here. And then here is the library where the gentlemen would go uh, to smoke their cigars. So the parlor was the room in your house where you would do your entertaining. It was your uh, reception room. It was also a setting for social events. It was supposed to be public and formal. Uh, this is where Anna would have her sewing meetings. Uh, the live, sorry, this is where she'd have her sewing meetings. Um, and this is where if you were paying a call, this is where you would be um, uh, visited. This is where you would pay your call. And then this is where you would wait when you were having uh, dinner. It was intended, the primary, uh, point of the parlors where you would have conversation. It's meant to be tastefully decorated and it should reflect uh, different places you had traveled, your different interests. In this case, uh, the Phillipses, there's a lot of, there's a piano, there's a Victrola, uh, there's a lot of maritime uh, knickknacks here in the parlor. And this is the most important part, as I mentioned, was this is where you wanted to have conversation. And to be able to converse well is an attainment which should be cultivated by every intelligent man and woman. One etiquette but book said, to be a good talker, one should be possessed of much general information acquired by keen observation, attentive listening, a good memory, extensive reading and study, logical habits of thought, and a correct knowledge of the use of language. When you were in the parlor, you wanted to avoid religion, politics, and money. They were considered topics that were dangerous to harmony. So you wanted to avoid those if you wanted to have a lovely evening conversation. You could talk about points of history, matters of literature, customs of particular countries, places you had traveled, um, anything else except religion, politics, and money. You wanted to avoid those. Uh, to end the evening, the gentleman, oops, let me go back. The gentleman would leave the library. In this case, they're at the Phillips house. They'd walk across the hall into the parlor. They would rejoin the ladies. One lady would rise and say goodbye or good night. The hostess would rise and shake their hand. Uh, then they would leave out the front door. This is the front door of Chestnut Street. And then they would leave where their chauffeur would be waiting. Uh, here's the Phillips house. They would leave, their chauffeur would be waiting to take them home and escort them back to their own homes for the evening. And there were two forms of farewell. There was goodbye and good night. And with that, I would like to thank you all for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have about the Phillips House, about etiquette in general. And thank you to Janice for asking me to come. But uh, that is my presentation for the evening, but I'm happy to answer any questions.